Good afternoon. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the process of global innovation and to give uh, some big ideas that we've seen in our team at UNICEF emerging over the last few years. My name is Chris Fabian. I co-lead the innovation unit in UNICEF New York. We're a group of about five people in New York, supported by about 20 or 30 amazing folks in UNICEF's country offices around the world, looking at how to solve some of the world's most difficult challenges. And I'll talk briefly about what those types of challenges are. Um, but I'd like to start with a quotation from a UNICEF staff member in Zambia. And he said about these big global challenges, the things that are on all of our minds in the room today, I think things like climate change, things like what happens when cities fundamentally change, things like global health epidemics. I mean, these are the big issues of the next generation and the issues that need to be attacked and thought through. And Bernard Cassava in Zambia said, just because the problems are so big and so complicated, we assume that the solutions need to be also big and complicated. But sometimes a simple thing can go very far. And I'd like to talk about how we can help those simple things go far in the world that we live in today. And I'd like to propose to you that there are three main principles by which we can take a simple thing and loft it into the air and, and help it give it some speed and really move. And those, those three things are not new things. Uh, the idea of openness is an old idea when Benjamin Franklin decided to not take a patent on his cook stove but to make it a public good. I mean, that was a long time before Creative Commons was established. The idea of global networks of information aren't new either. Coca-Cola has known where every bottle of its sodas and juices are at any point around the world. And the idea of hyper-local innovation and development of ideas isn't also that new. Um, if anybody's seen the, the recent article about Oreo cookies, which often have historically come as chocolate and vanilla and chocolate, are hyper-local. In Russia, they taste of caviar, and in China, they taste of green tea. This is a development that's happened in the last five years because of globalization, but because of an understanding that that globalization needs to be also traced to a hyper-local set of desires and wants. So none of those three things are new in themselves, but I'd like to suggest to you in the next 15 minutes or so that by combining those three ideas and those three concepts, we can start to attack some of these wicked big problems, and we can start to look at ways to change the way we change the world that are quite different from some of the methods that we've historically used. Um, to start this, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the organization that I work for, about UNICEF, and about some of the problems we face. And then I'll tell you a story, and then I'll give you some principles. And that seems fair to me. Um, so what do I mean by global scale? UNICEF is a big organization. We have offices in 135 countries. We're supported by another 30 countries that do our fundraising for us create support in what we call the Global North. UNICEF has over 15,000 staff, and UNICEF works on a host of issues, these naughty problems, these wicked problems. Um, we separate them into thematic areas. Um, this is a, a muak band, this thing that the kid has around their arm. Uh, the band tells the circumference of the upper arm. Muak is mid-upper arm circumference. It tells the upper arm circumference of a child between zero and five years, which is when most child deaths occur. The upper arm circumference is a steady indicator of the child's nutrition status. It doesn't matter if they're two years old or four years old. As long as that's in the green area of the band, the child is healthy. As it gets to yellow, they become malnourished. And red, they're severely malnourished. And their chances of surviving past five decrease radically. Uh, child hunger, child nutrition is an issue that kills almost 50% of children who die under five. UNICEF works on issues like HIV and AIDS. So this kid is holding a picture of a generation above him. And I don't know if, this, if those are parents of, of this kid or if they're just an older generation. But the HIV AIDS epidemic has eliminated a generation in many of the countries where we work. If you go to East Africa, you'll find very, very few old people. But you'll also find a missing generation of parents, which means that life skills that kids need to learn I mean, everything from Jamie Oliver's, you know, how to cook with your local foods to other life skills that help you survive into your teens and into adulthood aren't being taught by the parents. So there's this gap. 
There's just a blankness and an emptiness. 85% of the world doesn't have access to clean water, which means that when they drink dirty water, dirty water from, I mean, this is a hand pump, that's quite clean. If they drink from a stream or a puddle, there's a, an increased chance of getting diarrhea or other waterborne disease. And diarrhea kills you because it dehydrates you. It sucks all the water out of you. In the mid-80s, a group of very smart people in Southeast Asia pioneered a type of oral rehydration salt. So you can buy them in the pharmacy here. You can get a packet of ORS, oral rehydration salt, which is great. It's pre-mixed. It tastes pretty good. The basic ingredients in that are water and salt and sugar. And, and a group of very bright people pioneered a way, an open source way, an open thinking way, to show people how to measure the right amounts of salt and sugar and water to make those oral rehydration salts in your house. UNICEF and many others helped to scale those measurements and that way of explaining the measurements around the world. Oral rehydration salts are one of the ways to combat waterborne disease, but there's still an enormous problem of lack of access to clean water, lack of access to good hygiene. UNICEF works on issues of education and global education. This is TEDx Alto. It's a great place to talk about the needs of education. Global education is an enormous need. That's a school in northern Uganda, and that's a school with 5,000 kids in it. And that's a school where there was no microphone. So when I was talking, the teachers had to shout what I said back and back and back, which meant that I could only say two or three sentences at a time, which means that you can't learn very quickly, and there's no internet. There's no information. There's no access to opportunity. We need to change the way we think about education on a global level in order to give these ch kids a chance to stand up on stage and say something about their world. UNICEF works in, in the world of child protection as well. Child protection for us means identity, means having a, a birth certificate. And that's very simple. And I have a passport in my bag, and, and you all exist. But if you don't have that record, you don't exist, which means you don't get health care, you don't get to go to school. And if there's something like the tsunami that happened, and if you're a kid in Aceh, in Banda Aceh, Indonesia, and after the tsunami, if people come in airplanes and they come before the aid workers, which they do, and they come to traffic you, and they come to take you and put you in an airplane and send you, and those guys get there before any international aid does, before the military does, and they get to put you in an airplane and send you somewhere else, there's no record of you ever having existed, and so there's no record of where you've gone. These are the type of issues that I'm talking about, these are, these are big global issues. Um, UNICEF, I mean, other global issues are about commodities. We're the, one of the largest, we're the world's largest procurer of vaccines. UNICEF buys about 60% of the world's vaccines. So you can shape global markets when you buy that much stuff. UNICEF is the world's largest purchaser of pencils as well. I don't think we shape the pencil market as much as the vaccine market. And, of course, there are emergencies. In 2010, UNICEF was in over 98 countries in emergencies to address issues that happen. And, and I think people are quite familiar with these pictures of boxes and warehouses and, and Princess Kate in the warehouse in Copenhagen moving supplies to emergencies. UNICEF has one of the best logistics systems in the world. And those are the global. How do we get from global to very local solutions to some of these issues? And I'd like to just tell a story about mobile phones. So mobile phones are a great example of a global network. And in fact, in the last few years, the fact that we've reached 98% population coverage in the world by mobile signal, and we still have 85% of people without access to clean water, is a really interesting story about private sector and the commercial ability to capitalize on what people really want. This is a map of electricity in, in Africa. That we have 24 hours a day electricity. We have 365 days a year electricity. There's not a lot of it. Right, you see big urban centers and around the crusty edges. This is a map from two years ago of GSM coverage. And if you look at the difference there, you can immediately see that where people are struggling to communicate, to get access to information, they will build ways to create these other services. So where there's no electricity but there's GSM coverage, people are charging their phones on hand pumps, on batteries from cars, and a variety of other ways. Human ingenuity moves faster in a lot of, a lot of ways than, than technology. And so we were looking at that map, those two maps, a few years ago. And we were looking at, at Zambia. And Zambia is a country where to get between the top part of Zambia and the middle part of Zambia can take 18 or 20 hours, depending on the condition of the roads, if you're traveling by car. It's a small country, but the distances are really great. And so I just want to tell you for a minute the story of a community health worker, of somebody in Zambia who is so local to the problems of health 
that affect young children, to the problems of HIV AIDS. The community health worker is somebody in a village who sits at the core of a community and tries to provide basic services, but maybe doesn't have the training or the capacity to offer anything close to the kind of health care that we might have access to in Finland or in Europe and in the rest of the world. In order to get to that community health worker, and I'll, I'll take you to her in a minute, I just want to talk about the world slightly above her. This is a district hospital in Zambia. A district hospital may serve a population of 200,000 people. That's a fairly high burden for a facility like that. You'll find queues of people, mothers, waiting to deliver, sitting out in the sun. That's at the top level. If we go a little bit closer to hyper-local, to where the problem actually is, and in Zambia, the problem of the community health worker is getting test results from babies back from the district hospital to themselves, to the mother. And the test results are test results of HIV AIDS, the tests of the virus in the baby. And those tests have to be taken from the baby on a piece of paper, taken up to a capital city, run through a PCR machine, and sent back. And that process takes 60 days, six zero. And if the kid is not put on antiretroviral drugs to stop the spread of the HIV virus, there's a 30% greater chance of them dying by the first year and an increasingly greater chance every six months after that. So that time is critical. And this is like somewhere up towards the top of that system where the test results are still on paper. They haven't even been processed yet. Let's look a little bit closer to the community health worker who needs to get those test results back to the mother so that she can get the mother and get the baby on drugs. This is a, a group of community health workers at a clinic in Zambia. Um, the training that they might get is is basic. It's, uh, it's information about how to diagnose uh, some simple diseases, things like the Muak band. It's information about how to get the right drugs to the kid, but it's maybe not more than that. This is where they work. Community health workers in Zambia do have a mobile phone, and it's amazing. Even if they don't have signal where they are, they know where signal is, and it's like the new water point. You saw that hand pump. Right? People know where the water point is. People know where they can walk, where they can get on top of a hill and get a signal. And so we started looking there at how we could help these community health workers with their mobile phone get information that they could use to save a child's life more quickly. And we looked at where they were, and they're in the middle of two systems. They're torn between this big national system on one side over there and this local community, and they're really, they're really ripped between these two because they maybe have some training, but not all of it, and they're responsible to the community, but not all the way. And so we looked at what we could do to empower them, and the way that we did that was by sending a team of designers and of students and of thinkers from the ministry out to the community health worker rather than doing it in like, the capital city, sending them out and putting them in that office and sitting them there for four weeks, five weeks, and saying, what can you do? What does the community health worker need how can you build a system with her to get those results back more quickly that are taken on a piece of paper and taken up to the capital city and sent back by paper? And what this team of developers and designers and thinkers came up with, with the community health worker, not for them, was a way to send the results back by a text message to the community health worker saying yes or no, put the kid on drugs now or don't. And by doing that, they managed to shrink the amount of time by making that loop by sending, you know, so the paper is still going up to the capital city and the text message is coming back. They managed to shrink the amount of time that it took to get the diagnosis, to get the information back, to get the kid on drugs by almost an order of magnitude. And this type of change is great, but it's great because it comes from the point of need. We couldn't have designed this system here in, in Helsinki or in New York or in Geneva. It's designed at the point of need and it's being scaled and it's being used in other places. So this is in Zambia. At the ministry level, you can see how many results are being delivered to community health workers. But this system is also being used in Malawi. It's going to be used in Uganda and Rwanda. That same system can be taken and put into other places, adapted, localized. And so I just want to now talk about that type of simple innovation. That's, there's nothing complicated about creating faster paper. And I want to talk about the four or five, five principles that we've seen as key to driving the expansion of those type of ideas. The first one is, is well, these are all fall under the general canopy of openness. Um, User-centered design. And I, I think that designers get very heavily involved in the discussion of what design means. And what I mean by this is letting people design their own designs, letting people design the worlds around them that they want, not designing for, but designing with, collaborating at the point of need and letting people identify and adapt solutions and helping them scale. That's an egoless design, by the way. You don't get credit for that. 
You don't get your name on an award. It's a different type of design. Openness is, is fundamental and important, and I think everything that we do has to be open and has to be fully open. Like a door or a window can be partially open, and that's fine. And we are seeing companies around us, close to us here, around the world, die right now because they don't understand the need in this world, in this global economy, for radical transparency and total openness. So this is not keeping some things closed and keeping them open, but it's being very open about what works and what doesn't. It's sharing your ideas, because the ideas are easy. Everybody has an idea, that's the easy part. It's looking at systems that can take those ideas and send them through and build through experience. Um, we fail a lot, our team fails at least 70% of the time. And we try to be very public about that. We try to be very open about it because it's only, everybody fails, right? Nobody's perfect. And it's only by learning from those failures and, and sharing those with others that we can avoid creating systems that don't work and putting our ego and our faith in them and, and looking two years later and sort of seeing that nothing's happened. In order to build on experience, you need to have people locally who know more than you do about the problems and about how to solve them. And so one thing that I would say again, and this comes down to, to reducing ego in design and having a lack of hubris in how one designs things, is that you have to look at how you can support with skills, with the texture of what you've learned and what you're learning here, the systems that create those skills in others. So these are two programmers in, uh, in Zambia who are working on this rapid SMS system and they're being used by countries around them to build out similar systems. And I think they're now being offered jobs by the government as well, being stolen from UNICEF. And that's a wonderful thing. And the last, the last principle that we've seen as core to this work is sort of the, the, the principle of scalability and looking at what's already there in an ecosystem, what you can build with that exists. So when Amy Smith talks about templates, and she has a wonderful discussion about what, what she thinks of as a template when she goes with her team from the D-Lab in MIT and goes and designs in rural Uganda or in Haiti where there's nothing. When Amy Smith talks about a template, she's not talking about a Word template, or a PowerPoint template, or a CAD template. She's talking about a piece of sheet metal that you can poke holes in with a machete, and those holes can become the pivots for parts of a simple machine. And if you can take that piece of sheet metal and take that machete from one village to another, somebody else can put that over another piece of sheet metal and poke those same holes in it and replicate and replicate, and that's a template that scales because it uses what's in the system already rather than bringing something from outside and hoping that it's going to survive in a very foreign, very different sort of ecosphere than it was designed for. Um, I'd like to just invite you to, to take a look at some of these projects, some of the work that's happening. There's an amazing movement, I believe, in the world of development today and in the world of change making that harnesses those principles and that you'll see a lot more of in the future. We've got a great collaboration with the Alto folks here and I look forward to seeing that move forward and I think you can find out more about it here. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon and uh, I'm happy to chat afterwards.